looking up. The Greek has gone for help. I know, his nostrils fluttering. Give me your axe, his mouth like twine. Shell this look-alike and load the armour up. Tall plumes go bob. And you, saw Peden's armourer, an axe apart, who once had fifty stitches in his face, up with his shoulders, yes, like that, and you could strike a match upon the scar. Now, stretch its neck across that rock, his arm held out behind, still looking down. Glaucus, I asked you for your axe. Zephyrs disturbed their bare skins. Mask meets mask. Then Glaucus said, Before you use Patroclus' fat to grease your chariot hubs, overlord Hector, ask yourself how Troy can be held without Sarpedon's men. Dog in the forehead, but at heart a deer, Recall the luckless morning when you kicked your silk and silver counterpane aside and found your coast alive with shrieking Greeks. After the shock of it, was not Sarpedon's name the first to cross your lips, whose help you begged, though all you brought was, we would be obliged and thank you, thank you, when he promised it, keeping his promise with half Lycia, but now that he is dead and has no fellow, how do you keep your obligation, Hector? Begging my axe to violate the one Greek corpse sufficiently revered to change for his, wanting Achilles' gear to pod your beef, and giving Helen's reject time to fetch more of our enemies up. I know, I know. Day one a friend, day two a guest, day three a chore. Sarpedon's death makes me the Lycian chief. Why should we risk ourselves for Hector's wall who leaves his ally naked in a ditch? Thin, wavering heat, big flakes of sand, live things blown right and left. The tail end of a banner wraps a soldier's face. Why fight? The wind brings leaves enough to light a fire. You will not die saluting, Glaucus, will you? Prince Hector said. And to the rest, get the bones home. When Greece comes back, I shall be good enough to watch. Patroclus, naked now. The armor stacked beneath a chariot rug. Lead on. silent as men grown old while following sheep. They watch him wheel away. Seabirds eye view. Soldiers around Patroclus, centaur ants hoisting a morsel, and on the whaleback's tidal side, Ajax and little Ajax, Menelaus, Odysseus, and his driver, Bombax, head a wedge of plate-faced Greeks. Close up on Bombax. Forty-five, fighting since two, who wears his plate beneath his skin, one who has killed more talking bipeds than Troy's wall has bricks, whose hair is long, is oiled, is white, is sprung, plated with silver wire, twice plated. Strong? Why, he could swing a city to and fro with it and get no crick, whose eye can fix a spider's web, yoking a tent peg to its guy five miles down beach and count its spokes. By night? See. Greece come padding down the coastal lane, flow up the low-browed crested cliffs, across the backs, two hundred plus, then at Odysseus' sign, drop flat and steer their helmets through the sabre grass, lining the shoulders of the bay to look down upon Glaucus and the corpse. Ready, Odysseus says, their massed plumes nod. Moving at speed, but absolutely still, the arrow in the air, Death in a man as something first perceived by accident. Massed hands, massed glare, the piston kneed blade flailing Greeks pour down like a gigantic fan with razored veins, leaping the hummock studded slope up down as if the ground between each clump was taut, was trampoline, up down, so slow they fly, so quick upon the sand. Glaucus, an instant blinded by the sky-white backflash off their polished front, but in the next, scanning them through its after-image, cool as the antrium of a mossy shrine, and shouts, Close! Close! 
too late, alas. Before his voice is out, their masks are on him like a waterfall. Who was it said that one long day's more work will see it done? Up to the waist in dead. Dear Lord, he prays. Dear Lord, his soldiers dead. By day, their souls like babies rising from their lips. A river in the sky. Keep close! By night, an Amazon. Save us from this and I will build a stone. Close! Closer still! Temple that bears... Now, slope your shield! Shadows of deer at sunset. And thy name. Clenching his men about Patroclus' corpse, faced by a fly, all eyes, an egg with eyes. We have it still! Attacked by eyes. Edge out! Arrows that thock, that enter eyes, that pass close as a layer of paint, that blind, that splash about them like spring rain. Bombax takes heads like chopping 12-inch logs for exercise. Feathers of blood surround him like a bronze on decorative water. Hector, where? Dog in the forehead, but at heart a doe. A sunlight jumps from cheek to shiny cheek, eager to glorify their transients. Not to climb Leto's chair, that way lies death, Anaxapart, who does not hear. His eyes on Pyrop, the Macedonian ham, as little Ajax christened him. The richest and the fattest Greek, a chariot factory plus numerous farms, to sail from Liminaria to Troy, who looks behind him, half crouched down, as timid and as fearful as a dog about to shit. Run, Greek, run, run, Anaxapart insists, and fool, instead of burrowing among the shields, poor Pyrop does, and running cries, My mother is alone and old and sick. But what fear urged obesity held back. Six arrows in Anaxapart's clenched fist. My One, is two, and three, then four, five, six, in the air at once. Why, ye? Even Odysseus paused to catch that trick. And the arrows go so fast their shanks ignite, and the hits make Pyrop flounce, and he cannot hold his mud. Six hammer blows upon his neck, and long before his voice, so high, so piteous and profound, died out, Anaxapart's keen zanies sheared his tin. Pleasure may be, but not a sign of victory in this. Glaucus shows red, bent as is seen through water, split tip hooked, both edges blunted on Greek flesh, his sword. This is our end, my lord. His feet go backwards, treading on the dead, that sigh and ooze like moth. Heaven is silent. Earth does not confide. I turn around. The way to Troy is barred. Patroclus in their midst, around him shields, around the shields, the masks. Close! Close! Achilles' armour was not made on earth. A lame god yoked its spacious particles. Ten years' deliberate inattention have only enhanced its light collecting planes, into whose depth, safe, safe amid the dunes, Prince Hector looks, amazed, and strips his own. Stands naked in the light, amazed, and lifts its bodice up and kisses it, then holds it out, and like a man long kept from water, lets its radiance pour down, and sees within the clouds that pass, the gulls that stall, his own hope-governed face, and near its rim, distorted as the brilliant surface bends its rivetless, near-minus weight away, his patient horses and his men. Then, through the azure vacancy in which our cooling onion floats, clouds long as lips, God's lips above the mountain, saying, Worm, your death is nearer than your nose. Perhaps you told Patroclus as he went. Perhaps was wrong. But I will let you fight, dressed as the gods are dressed, and give your heart a priceless boost until oblivion's resistless whisper bids its pulse a drum between two torches in the night to follow your creation on their way. The clouds have altered now, upgathered like a continental shelf, crowned by mauve air and down their pillowed range emerald-stained chrome through leaf to orange-gray, 
clear to the listening eye their caves read dusk, though that dim porch is Ganges' length away. Hector is in the armour. A soldier lifts a coiling ox horn to his lips, and though its summons bumps the tower where Priam sits beside a lip that slides out of a stone lion's mouth into a pool, the king is old and deaf and does not move. One thousand Trojan soldiers form a ring. They link their arms. They breathe in unison. Lay back their faces till each throat stands wide and wait and wait. Then on the master beat, shatter the Empyrean with a cry. Then stamp, then cry, then stamp again, then cry. Cry over following cry, concordant stamp on stamp, until the far translucent hue augments their promising to die and rides forward to sunset on their God for Troy. Hector is in the middle of that ring, crouched on his toes, his knees braced wide, palms up, white dactyls tigered, arms outspread. And now his certain triple-armoured mind, by God, the holy metal and his men, grows light, grows lucent, clarified for death. And as their voices mix above their prints, he rocks from toe to toe, and as they stamp, first one and then the other of his feet, lifts from the sand, and as they lean and lead into a skip-step sunwise trapes around, though Hector keeps his body jackknifed down, adding his voice to theirs, he starts to turn, counter their turn, to lift himself, to spin, becoming in their eyes a source, a sun, a star whose force is theirs, who leaps, unfolds his body in the air, prances upon the air, and in the air unsheaths Achilles' sword and makes it sing. See how they flow towards him, arms upraised, table their shields to keep his dance aloft, and cry again, and cry, and start to pour over the dunes, him spinning on that top, across the buff and onward to the bay, Achilles' blade about his waist, so fast, a symbol struck by voices, shimmer struck, out of whose metal centre Hector's own, seething between his teeth, wails up the sky on one insatiable note. And as his wail spread outward on the air, and as the stolen armour ached the light, those fighting round Patroclus' body thought Earth had upthrust a flow of luminous molt that swamped their world and pitched the famous Greeks back to the crest and filled the bay with waves. And surfacing upon that molten sludge, with Glaucus in his arms, Prince Hector said, as he wiped the crawling stains away, Remember me? Aeneas goes by so close, his slipstream pats their cheeks. Remember me. And rings Patroclus with a horse high, set too close for the point of a spear's tip, wall of a hundred oxhide shields. Impacted battle, dust above a herd, trachea, source of tears, sliced clean, deckle-edged wounds, a face split off, sent skimming, lid-like through the crunch, still smiling, but its pupils dots on dice. Bodies so intermixed, the tremor of their impact keeps the dead upright within the mass. Half dragged, half born, killed five times over, Kafno rose with his oar, sang as his wrapped ship ran its sunside strake through the lace of an oncoming wave, now splashed with blood plus salva from his chest to chin, borne back into the mass, itself borne back and forth across the bay like cherry froth. Someone breaks out, another follows him, throws, hits, rides on, the first transfixed, hauls on the carefully selected pole, trembling within his groin, and drags his bladder out with it, then doubles pop-eyed back into the jam. Notice the Cretans, little A and big, some team, Prince Little loves to tease them with his ass. I'll screw your widow, batted ass, shouting head down, his face between his knees. And when the angered Trojan throws, he throws, twisting and catching what the other threw, and has the time to watch his leaf divide his fellow soldier from the light, and goes, no third green generation from his tree, whistling away. 
The Greeks swear by their dead, the Trojans by their home. Not one step back! If I should die... And does. Water through water, who can tell whose red, whose raw it is? Their banners overclouding one by one, one after one, and then another one. An axe apart has tied Patroclus' body to a shield, spread eagled on its front, with Zetes and Obnoctophon as crucifers. And much as their posterity will spurn vampires with garlic, ignorance with thought, those Trojans elevate his corpse and claim, Gangway for Troy! while in the chariot length their idol gains, with finger bells and feathered necklaces, Molo, the dancer from Symmatrix, tugs at its penis as he squeaks, Achilles, love! Trumpets behind the corpse, more Trojan masks, then tambourines and drums, not one step back, but must. Troy! Troy! If I... And does seeking a quiet eddy in the flood, blood flowing from his nostrils. Odysseus, who fights without the aid of anger, says, Demetrian, run to the fleet. Give wonder sulk our news. His love is dead, his armour gone, Prince Hector has the corpse, and as an afterthought, that we are lost. Why me, Odysseus? That is the why. Now go, and not so gloomy, if you wish to please. Fast as the strongest wing can fly between the twilight and the setting sun, he goes. Elsewhere, the afternoon goes lazily enough. No sign of cloud, small noises cross the air intact. And yawning as he leaves his tent to sigh and settle back against a rope as some men settle into life quiet in quiet rooms, supplied with all they need by mute, obedient hands, Achilles, who does his best to blimp the queasy premonitions that explode beneath his heart. No matter how, how much, how often, or how easily you win. Oh, my Patroclus, are you bitten off? Demetrian, appearing through these words, hateful the voice that springs between his clear-edged lips, weakening Odysseus' message too is gone. Down on your knees, Achilles. Further down. Now forward on your hands and put your face into the dirt and scrub it to and fro. Grief has you by the hair with one and with the forceps of its other hand uses your mouth to trowel the dog shit up. Watches you lift your arms to heaven and then pounces and screws your nose into the filth. Gods have plucked drawstrings from your head and from the template of your upper lip modelled their bows. Not now, not since your grieving reaches out and pistol whips that envied face until, frightened to bear your black, back-breaking agony alone, you sank, throat back, thrown back, your voice thrown out across the sea to reach your source. Saltwater woman, eternal. She heard him. Long bodied Thetis who lives in the wave, in the coral. Fluorescent. Green over grey, over olive, forever. The light falling sideways from heaven. She heard him. Achilles her marvellous sun, surge in her body, head ferns grow wider, grow paler, her message, his message, goes through the water, sister, ne rule say, sisters, eternal, Salt water women came when she called to them 
came through the waves to her, swam as she swam towards Greece, beyond Greece. Now she passes the islands, arm over arm, swimming back ways, peaked nipples, full fifty green, grey, paley, shimmering kith of King Neus. Those who leave eddies, who startle her sisters. Diana, Lucate, Life Farm Augusta, Iso, Nefaria, Black Chevron Cos, Panope, Beaded, Entwining Galithio, Thassos, Talita, Hymno and Phile, Sleek Manaferium, Jethis, Bardia, Serpentine Xanthi, Nemix, and Simi came from the Iodine, surfaced through Asia onto the beachhead and lay round Achilles. What cause have you to weep, his mother said. It was your hands God saw, your voice he heard, uplifted, saying, Lord, until they feel my lack, let the Greeks burn, let them taste pain. And heard him say, Poor source, wet-cheeked, much wronged, long-suffering Thetis, Famous in time as the eternal moan, that dowry of heaven-sent weapons you brought, my brutal father, when your father forced you to divide your legs for oafish him, pods, Hector, now, and I, the paradigm of all creation's violent hierarchy, sit naked by the sea and number waves. Excellent that my Greekish aids taste pain, and better that they die, but not enough, not agony enough. Increase that pain, without appeal and without delay, let death come down, and not please God, for I will be his master either way, exclusively to Agamemnon's lead, but on to Troy, and on to Troy beyond, and unto all of us, brain damage, stinking herd of god-foxed sheep, chiefs of our loathsome thought, polluted dot, bar two. Hector's dark head is mine. You cannot have it without armour, child, his mother said, and vanished through the waves with all her school. Sun fades. Sea breathing. Sea lice trot over warm stones. Achilles and Demetrian. How small they look beneath the disappearing sky. Sap rises in them both. An opening breeze ruffles their hair, but only A hears. Greek. Yes? Greek. Who? Iris. Speak. Go to the ditch. Let Troy know you are back. Until your strength is operational, your voice must serve. You know what fighting is. When things are at their worst, an extra shout can save the day. He goes. Consider planes at touchdown, how they poise, or palms beneath a numbered hurricane, or birds wheeled sideways over windswept heights, or burly salmon challenging a weir. Right-angled, dreamy flyers as they ride the instep of a dying wave or trace diagonals on snow slopes. Jump cuts like these may give some definition to the mind's wild eye that follow spots Achilles' holy pair. No death, no dung, no loyalty to men in them. Come, Troy side down the dunes towards the bay. Achilles' charioteer, Alastor, lost on their basket's plate, locked to their reins, pulling with all his might to make them stay. That also Iris heard, that know their care, their semi-human clay, their half-loved, half-obeyed, half-childlike Lord Achilles will demand their services. 
each worth at least an income of 10,000 men a day. Headlock, body slam, Hector attacking, his anger, his armour, his now, now or never, O oh infinite, endless Apollo, I in my weakness beseech you to cast all thought of peace on earth for me away without possession of that corpse. Hard to say who is who, the soldiers, the captains, their guts look alike. Ajax alone between it and their thirst, pivoting on his toes, his arms looped up, safe in his hands, his spear's moist butt that whirs, who falls into that air screw, kiss goodbye. And for a moment, Hector driven back, and when and if, and here it comes, on, 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 he cries, die on that spear. The Trojans try to snake beneath its point, and Ajax down on one, and with the other foot, thrusts himself round until the spear's bronze talk hisses a finger's width above Patroclus' face, as Bombax shouts, Hear, Ajax, hear! As Menelaus, hear! And while his brother keeps his back, Aeneas taunts, Crapulous mammoth! Thicker than the wall, Ajax, the wordless chattel of his strength, and spits and runs, and yes, the Greek is hooked, who follows him and throws a hit. Odysseus holds his breath. Alas, Apollo hates that shot. Forth went the hand of clarity across the twilit air and tipped the straight-grained, bronze-fanged pole aside. God scum, said Bombax, only to himself. Aeneas through the blades, brushing their strokes aside, up the far slope with Ajax far behind, and sees Alastor entering the bay between the horn and Leto's chair, and sprints towards its brink, and two, one, off, free fall, free fall, swooping upon Alastor in his car as angels in commemorative stones still swoop on unknown soldiers as they die for some at best but half-remembered cause. And as Alastor swerved, Aeneas' axe enhanced the natural crackage of his skull, and he quit being, while his pair skid slithered through the tumult, flailed that mass, and overran Patroclus' tattered corpse. Hector triumphant, dropping his spear, clenching his fist, raising his fists in the air, shaking his fists with delight, who brings it out will share the fame with me. An axe apart has got it by the chin, knees bent, spine bowed, feet braced into the clavicles, wrenching the nut right, left, right, right, thinks, screw the bastard off. Leaning across an axe apart, Prince Hector shouts, on, on, trying to slash at Bombax and the Greeks, who have Patroclus by the feet and tug. Ah, they tug. Ah! The body stretched between them like a hide. Five miles due north, Achilles on the rampart by the ditch. He lifts his face to ninety, draws his breath, and from the bottom of his heart emits so long and loud and terrible a scream, the icy scabs at either end of earth winced in their sleep, and in the heads that fought, it seemed as if, and through his voice alone, the whole world's woe could be abandoned to the sky. And in that instant, all the fighting glassed. Odysseus accepted. Quick as a priest who waits for passing birds to form a letter in the air, he has Patroclus' body up and out. And as Prince Hector shouts, the Greeks have got their carrion intact. The sun, head of a still surviving kingdom, drew the earth between them and himself. And so the plain grew dark. Starred sky. Calm sky. Only the water's luminosity marks the land's end. A light is moving down the beach. It wavers, comes towards the fleet. The hulls like upturned glasses made of jet. Is it a god? No details, yet. 
Now we can hear a drum. And now we see it. Six warriors with flaming wands, eight veteran bearers and one prince, Patroclus, dead, crossed axes on his chest upon a bier. Gold on the wrists that bear the prince aloft, tears on the cheeks of those who lead with wands. Multiple injuries adorn the corpse, and we, the army, genuflect in line. Five years ago, Achilles robbed a Phrygian citadel and kept the temple cauldron for himself. The poet who accompanied him to Troy deciphered the inscriptions on its waist. One said, I am the earth, the other, void. And when from zigzagged ewers his female slaves had filled and built a fire beneath its knees, Achilles laved the flesh and pinned the wounds and dressed the yellow hair and spread ointments from Thetis' cave on every mark of what Patroclus was and kissed its mouth and wet its face with tears and kissed and kissed again and said, My love, I swear you will not burn till Hector's severed head is in my lap. Rat. Pearl. Onion. Honey. These colors came before the sun lifted above the ocean bringing light alike to mortals and immortals. And through this falling brightness, through the by now, mosque, eucalyptus, utter blue, came Thetis gliding across the azimuth with armor the color of moonlight laid on her forearms her palms upturned, her hovering above the fleet, her skyish face towards her son. Achilles gripping the body of Patroclus, naked and dead against his own, while Thetis spoke. Son, his soldiers looking on, looking away from it remembering their own. Grieving will not amend what heaven has done. Suppose you throw your hate after Patroclus' soul. Who besides Troy will gain? See what I have brought. And as she laid the moonlit armor on the sand, it chimed. And the sound that came from it followed the light that came from it, like sighing, saying, made in heaven. And those who had the neck to watch Achilles weep could not look now. Nobody looked. They were afraid. Except Achilles looked, lifted a piece of it between his hands, turned it, tested the weight of it, and then spun the holy tungsten like a star between his knees slitting his eyes against the flare, some said, but others thought the hatred shuttered by his lids made him protect the metal. His eyes, like furnace doors, ajar. When he had got its weight and let its industry console his grief a bit, I'll fight, he said, simple as that, I'll fight. And so Troy fell. But while I fight, what will become of this? Patroclus. Mother, inside an hour a thousand slimy things will burrow, and if the fight drags on, his flesh will swarm like water boiling. And she. Son, while you fight, nothing shall taint him. Sun will not touch him, nor the slimy things. 
Promising this, she slid rare eagles in the seven born openings of Patroclus' head, making the carrion radiant. And her Achilles went to make amends, walking alone beside the broken lace that hung over the sea's green fist. The sea that is always counting. Ever since men began in time, time and time again they met in parliaments, where in due turn, letting the next man speak, with mouthfuls of soft air, they tried to stop themselves from ravening their talking throats. Hoping enunciated airs would fall with very similitude in different minds and bring some concord to those minds. Soft air between the hatred dying animals monotonously bear toward themselves. Only soft air to underwrite the inbuilt violence of being, to meld it to something more civil, rarer than true forgiveness. No work was lovelier in history, and nothing failed so often. Knowing this, the army came to hear Achilles say, Pax Agamemnon, and Agamemnon's Pax. Now I must ask you to forget reality, to be a momentary bird above those men and watch their filings gather round the rumour of a conference until magnetic grapevines bind them close. From a low angle, the army looks oval, whitish-centred, split at one end, prized slightly open, and opposite to the opening, Achilles, who they have come to hear, with hard-faced veterans on either side, lance butts struck down, and here and there a flag. Even the chariot mechanics, tent makers, priests and whores came up to hear their lords say Pax. And as men will, they came, the limping kings. Odysseus first, chatting to little Ajax, through the ring, sitting them down, and after them a trifle slow, but coming all the same, doomed Agamemnon, king of kings, his elbow gummed with blood walking as if he had five legs. The ring is shut. Enormous calm. King Agamemnon and Achilles, face to face, distinct as polygon and square. Achilles first. King, I have been a fool. The arid bliss self-righteousness provokes addled my mind. Odysseus nods. Remembering how I took Briseis town and how its women offered me their flesh like simple creatures looking for a passage to the sea, it would have been far better for us both if God had pinned her to the gate. Yet I'm a man. I like my own. And if another man, my king, what's more, takes what is mine and lets the army know it, what are they both to do? Kings can admit so little. Kings know what damages their principality endangers all. If he is inconsiderate, he is the king. If greedy, greedy king. And if at noon the king says, it is night, behold the stars. What if he damages the man on whom his principality depends? He is still the king. His war goes on, the man must give. But if the man in question cannot give, because the God in him that makes the king his chief dependent is part and parcel of the God that cries revenge when he is wronged, what happens then? Stamp on my foot, my heart is stunned. I cannot help it. It is stunned. It rankles. Here. Touching his chest. I am not angry anymore. My heart is broken. Done is done, it says. And yet its pain can only mask my rancor. 
so let pride serve. When all is said and done, I am Achilles. And the army love their darling, and they cry louder than any counting sea, and sentries on the eastern wall of Troy sweat by their spears. Achille! 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 King Agamemnon waits. Achille! 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 And waits. Achille! 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 Then rising says, Heroes! I do not think your zeal will be injured if those who are the furthest off stand still and those in front stop muttering to themselves. Bad start. Everyone can't hear everything, of course. Gulls cry. However, even clear-voiced heralds, accustomed as they are to public speaking, can lose their audience if inattention makes them feel indifference to their message. Gulls. In fact, the things I have to say are, in a sense, meant for Achilles' ears alone. But if the army and his peers witness our settlement, my purpose will be better served. Like him, I am a man. But I am also king, his king, your king. And as your king, I have received what most of you have not unwillingly agreed was mine, the best part of the blame. He has them now. But I am not to blame. And now. Undoubtedly, I took unfairly, pulling rank, the girl Achilles won. I tell you, it was not my wish. Between my judgment and my action, Arte fell. God's eldest girl, contentious Arte. Oh, soft are her footsteps, but her performance keeps no day. Nor does she walk upon the ground, but drifts into our human wishes like the sticky flecks of down, tickling our lips in endless summertime. And with her episode comes misery. If you will lead the Greeks, Achilles, I will give Briseis back, and may we be forgiven. The sun is smaller now. Achilles says, Let us fight now, at once. Wait! And up between the dunes, with ribbons, tambourines and little drums, come twelve white horses led by seven women, Briseis in their midst, her breasts so lovely that they envy one another. And they pass by. And after them, young lords, escorting twenty ewers of bright silver, each in a polished trivet, their shining cheeks engraved by silversmiths with files of long-nosed soldiers on the march. And they pass by. And after them, a sledge, piled with twelve lots of Asian gold, carefully weighed, worth a small city. And they pass by. And last of all, guarding a sacrificial hog, Talphibios, chief herald of the Greeks, passed by into the center of the ring. Yellow mists over Mount Ida. The hog lowers its gilded tusks, is still. By Agamemnon's feet, Talphibius sprinkles barley, snips a tuft from the hog's nape, waits for a breeze to nudge it off his palm into the flames that burn between the army and its king. Haze covers Mount Ida. Sand falls down sand. 
even the gods are listless. And Agamemnon spreads his arms, raises his face towards the sun and cries, God, be my witness. Earth, my witness. Sun, sky, water, wind, my witness. I have not tampered with the girl I took unjustly from Achilles. And drags his knife across the hog's silk throat. Mists over Ida. Slaves gut and throw the dead hog in the sea. The army like 10,000 yellow stones. Achilles says, So be it. Eat and prepare to fight. And took Briseis to his ship. Under the curve the keel makes, where it sweeps upright to the painted beak, Achilles' tetrarchs placed their gilded oars, set twelve carved thwarts across them, then surfaced this stage with wolf and beaver fleece, amid whose stirring nap Patroclus lay, the damaged statue of a prince awaiting transportation. Near it Achilles sat, Odysseus beside, and women brought them food. Patroclus liked to eat, Achilles said. And you cooked well, Patroclus, didn't you? Particularly well that summer when the royal cuckold, crown in hand, came visiting from Argos, whining, wife, and theft, and war, and please, and... What is this eat, Odysseus? If you were telling me he's dead, your father, well, I might eat a bit, troubled, it's true, but eat like any fool who came God knows how many mist and danger mixed sea miles to salvage Helen. Oh, I know you, Odysseus. You think Achilles will fight better if he feeds. Don't be so sure. I do not care about his gifts. I do not care, Odysseus. Do not care. Patroclus was my life's sole love, the only living thing that called love out of me. At night I used to dream of how, when he came home to Greece, he'd tell them of my death, for I must die and show my son this house, for instance, or that stone beside the stream, my long green meadows stretching through the light, so clear it seems to magnify. And here Achilles falls asleep beside his dead. Odysseus goes off as close to tears as he will ever be. Now I shall ask you to imagine how men under discipline of death prepare for war. There is much more to it than armament and kicks from those who could not catch an hour's sleep, waking the ones who dozed like rows of spoons, or those with everything to lose, the kings, asleep like pistols in red velvet. Moments like these absolve the needs dividing men. Whatever caught and brought and kept them here under Troy's ochre wall for ten burnt years is lost, and for a while they join a terrible equality, are virtuous, self-sacrificing, free, and so insidious is this liberty that those surviving it will bear an even greater servitude to its root, believing they were whole while they were brave, that they were rich because their loot was great, that war was meaningful because they lost their friends. They rise, the Greeks, with smiling iron mouths. They are like nature, like a mass of flame, great lengths of water struck by changing winds, a forest of innumerable trees, boundless sand, snowfall across broad steppes at dusk. As a huge beast stands and turns around itself, the well-fed, glittering army stands and turns. Nothing can happen till Achilles wakes. He wakes. Those who have slept with sorrow in their hearts know all too well how short but sweet the instant of their coming to can be. 
the heart is strong as if it never sorrowed, the mind's dear clarity intact, and then the vast unhappy stone from yesterday rolls down these vital units to the bottom of oneself. Achilles saw his armour in that instant, and its ominous radiance flooded his heart. Bright pads with toggles crossed behind the knee, bodies of fitted tungsten, pliable straps, his shield as round and rich as moons in spring, his sword's haft parked between sheaves of grey obsidian, from which a lucid blade stood out, leaf-shaped, adorned with running spirals. And for his head, a welded cortex, yes, Though it is noon, the helmet screams against the light, scratches the eye, so violent it can be seen across three thousand years. Achilles stands, he stretches, turns on his heel, punches the sunlight, bends, then jumps, and lets the world turn fractionally beneath his feet. noon. In the foothills, melons emerge from their green hidings. Heat. He walks towards the chariot. Greece waits. Over the walls in Troy, mosquitoes hover. Beside the chariot, soothing the perfect horses, watching his driver cinch, shake out the reins and lay them on the rail. Dapple and white the horses are, perfect they are, sneezing to clear their cool black muzzles. He mounts. The chariot's basket dips. The whip fires in between the horse's ears. And as in dreams, or at Cape Kennedy they rise, slowly it seems, their chests like royals, yet behind them in a double plume the sand curls up, is barely dented by their flying hooves, and wheels that barely touch the world, and the wind slams shut behind them. Fast as you are, Achilles says, when twilight makes the armistice, take care you don't leave me behind as you left my Patroclus. And as it ran, the white horse turned its tall face back and said, Prince, this time we will, this time we can, but this time cannot last. And when we leave you, not for dead, but dead, God will not call us negligent as you have done. And Achilles, shaken, says, I know I will not make old bones, and laid his scourge against their racing flanks. Someone has left a spear stuck in the sand. 